Okay, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Today is June 23rd and this is a regular meeting and work session of the Cedar Rapids Community School District Board of Education. I'd like to call our meeting to order and ask someone to please read the approval of the agenda. That the agenda of Monday, June 23rd, 2014 Board of Education meeting be approved is set forth and that each item is considered ready for discussion and or action. Is there a second please? Second. This is a roll call action. Director Laverty. Aye. Director Westerkamp? Aye. Director Humbles? Aye. Director Anhalt? Aye. President Meisterling? Aye. Thank you. Next, I'm going to open this up to a public hearing <coughs> regarding a permanent electric line easement at McKinley Middle School for Alliant Energy. This is the time and place to receive public comment. Uh, Laurel, did you receive anything written or through email? I've received nothing in writing. Okay. Anyone wish to address the board regarding this easement? Seeing none, I will close this hearing out at this time. Next is superintendent and board reports, and Dave, we'll start with you. Good evening. Thank you. With summer break underway, I want to remind families that free healthy lunches are available for children through the Lynn County Summer Lunch Program. Multiple serving sites are located around Cedar Rapids and will provide lunch Monday through Friday during the summer. Thank you for the many volunteers who are making this program possible. Speaking of healthy lunches, Viola Gibson, third grader, um, Abby Braley was chosen as I was winner of the Healthy Lunchtime Challenge and Kids State Dinner Contest. She won for the recipe Over the Rainbow Veggie Pancakes. As the state winner, she will attend a state dinner at the White House this summer, hosted by First Lady Michelle Obama. Uh, congratulations, that's uh, quite an accomplishment. It should be a great educational opportunity for her. Kennedy High School class of 2015 will be the first class to sponsor a senior service project. The seniors will spend their year helping to build a home for Cedar Valley Habitat for Humanity. All members of the class will be involved either in building landscaping, painting, assisting habitat, restore, shop, or raising funds. The latest round of our innovative learning projects has been announced. Each project supports a creative learning environment and was selected through a rigorous review process. The two newest are technology and secondary music classroom at Kennedy High School and the use of Surface Pro tablets with keyboards at Roosevelt Middle School. Funding for these projects come from technology, school uh, infrastructure, local option, sales tax dollars. I'm pleased to add my congratulations to the city of Cedar Rapids on being named an All-American City. The panel of judges at the National Civic League in Denver named Cedar Rapids and nine other cities in, across America as All-American Cities for 2014. This is the first time Cedar Rapids has won the award. It is a national recognition of our quality city and certainly something all of us can be proud of. And finally, one of our cabinet members is retiring. I hope you will join me in congratulating Sue Clapp. This is Sue's last uh, board meeting officially. She has been res resolution team facilitator as well as president of CREA. 
Uh, she's had a 37-year career with Cedar Rapids schools during her career. She's taught at Grant, Cleveland, Grant Wood, Hoover, and Viola Gibson Elementary Schools. We wish her the very best, and on a personal note, uh, I will miss your smile and your good counsel. So thank you for all that you've done uh, for everybody here. <laughs> thank you, Sue. You'll be missed. Uh, next, any board reports? Yes. Uh, I would like to share that I attended the 25th anniversary for the Academy for Academic uh, and Scholastic, Scholastic and Personal Success this past Saturday. Uh, they had their eighth annual fundraiser and tribute. And uh, this award, they awarded two four former are the alum from Cedar Rapids. Uh, the four were Shamara Humbles, and she is sitting in the audience today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Todd, Bernard, <laughs> Todd Bernard and uh, Carl Cassell and Shante Thurman. It was a really nice event, um, and I enjoyed it. So I wanted to share that uh, that it was it was very nice. Thank you for attending and sharing that with us. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or reports from our board? Okay, seeing none. This is now time for uh, communications, delegations, and petitions. I do have a request from Lawrence Wanklowski. And just please state your name and address for the record. And you have five minutes, Lawrence. Yeah, Lawrence Wanklowski, 4234 Murrell Road, Northeast Cedar Rapids. Tonight, I originally wanted to share a positive experience I observed within the district several weeks ago. Instead, I come here with feelings I do not recall having at a board meeting. Before I continue, I must acknowledge there are many great teachers in the district who go the extra mile to educate students and pass on their love for the subjects they teach. At the last board meeting, a gentleman spoke in favor of the Expanded Opportunities Program, but by his own admission, his family had no experience in the program. Since just a week earlier, I sent a letter to staff about problems within the program, I wonder if he was asked to show up and make his comments. The reason I am here tonight is because of the negative impact this program has had on my family and the even greater negative impact other families have experienced. It is not a result of dislike or disrespect of any individual. The EO program is supposed to provide additional opportunities and encourage students to ch challenge themselves, not frustrate students, not have students question their ability and avoid advanced level classes. Prior to coming here tonight, I have tried to address my concerns for months. People ignored me, made commitments to me that they did not meet, and I was told that is not what they meant. Despite successes in the program, there are some serious problems which are swept under the carpet at the expense of students. People involved in the EO program find it acceptable for the top 10% of middle school students to receive grades of C's, D's, and F's. I do not know if the problems within the Expanded Opportunities Program are school-related, administrative, or labor-related. However, part of the problem is cultural. For example, if a student is told one thing by a teacher and the teacher tells the administrator they said something else, the teacher is always backed. There is a difference between right and wrong. Prior to expanding the EO program, this district failed to address and rectify concerns raised in previous years of the program. The district misrepresented the program, failed to communicate with participants, and failed to provide the appropriate resources for the program. The district squandered another opportunity to have a first class program. Last year, potential EO students were told assistance would be available starting at 7 a.m. This was not true, as some teachers played their trump card, their contract, which meant they would, some were not there available until 7.15, 7.30, or later, assuming they showed up. This time was divided among several students. If a student misses a makeup test, they get an F. If a teacher makes, misses a makeup test, the student is penalized. There is no penalty to student teachers for being late to meetings or missing commitments to students. Even when the Im its impact um, impacts students' learning and grades. 
This program does not provide counselors or advise students to drop classes when they are struggling. Concerns raised about classes are not communicated between schools or addressed. The EOO program lacks accountability and oversight. No one wants to take ownership for the program or make waves. With very few exceptions, everyone in the district receives a raise. Students are the only ones held accountable in the district and sometimes even penalized because of the lack of commitment by teachers. This school district has failed many expanded opportunity students and their families. I believe this board is unaware of the problems within the program and I am requesting an independent investigation into the problems within the program. The community wants accountability and I believe this the approval of the superintendent's contract along with all other administrative contracts should be put on hold until there is appropriate accountability. Students should always be treated fairly and with respect and as a parent I demand it. As a tax payer I demand the board represent the community and make sure there is accountability in the district. Okay. Uh, next is our consent agenda. I'd like to entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Thank you. And a second? Second. Any discussion on items in the consent agenda? <coughs> if not, this is a roll call action due to the personnel report. Director Westerkamp? Aye. Director Humbles? Aye. Director Anhalt? Aye. Director Laverty? Aye. President Meisterling? Aye. Thank you. Next, I'm going to turn this over to Carla to talk about the Iowa assessment results. Good evening. Um, we have recently received our Iowa assessment data, and I thought you might enjoy having a quick overview of some of that information. So we're going to provide that to you tonight. Um, Justin, or am I working it? <laughs> okay. The first slide here shows our reading proficiency data, and it gives you three years worth of data. The blue bar on the left is the data from 2013 to 2014, which is this year. The purple bar is 1213, and the yellow bar is 1112. So that you can see across that amount of time um, our, how our proficiencies have increased in that area of reading. The next uh, uh, slide shows you th the same thing, only three years worth of math data. Um, our overall proficiencies in the area of math are slightly higher. So um, you can see that reflected there versus the, the reading area. This slide talks a little bit about our science. It provides just that overall proficiency data for science. Again, three years worth of data on the left, 13, 14, moving to 11, 12. Um, it's important that we look at proficiency, but in a district this size, sometimes those numbers don't fluctuate a lot just because of the large numbers of students that we test. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to pull a little bit of information out for you regarding expected growth. An expected growth is based on a student's previous year test scores. Iowa testing said we would expect them to grow X amount. So we track that data for each one of our students. And um, we also, as well as the proficiency data, but we're, it's really important to us that we look at the growth of our kids over time. So a couple of pieces regarding expected growth. Um, 29 schools, or 94% of our schools, so we were pleased by that, increase the percent of students meeting expected growth in the area of reading. And 23 of those schools increased or maintained their percent of students meeting expected growth in the area of mathematics. So when we look at that expected growth piece, we were pleased. Um, a couple points on in the area of proficiency, we have 77% of our schools increasing or maintaining their proficiency rates and then 54% increasing or maintaining their math rates. Um, a little bit more detailed on that expected growth, I wanted to provide some information a little bit over time on, for you on that as well. If you look at this, the bar on the left shows a percent of our students meeting expected growth in 2011-12, and the bar on the right, the blue bar, shows the percentage of our students meeting expected growth this year. 
So if you look at that, we have had some very nice um, increases in those percentages that we, it's quite a celebration. We were very excited to see that. What happened in 11th grade? Yeah. Um, well, I don't know, Mary. That, I looked at that, too. I'm thinking it's kind of an anomaly. Um, that's, it just, that's not typical for 11th grade. Usually they're kind of one of our highest. So. How do you, how do you, so you see something like that. What, how do you uh, analyze that? How well, you we start looking into that a little bit more specifically by school, by, by um breaking it down into school, breaking it down into where are we not. Because even though they may not have met expected growth, they still may, that doesn't mean they're not proficient. So they can be proficient. They could be 89, 90, 95th percentile and maybe have been expected to grow, say, eight points, and they only grew seven. So it's, we have to dig that pretty fine to get to the bottom of that, which we're in the process of doing. Carla, were there any changes in the exam during this period of time? No, there were not. So it was the same mm -hmm. exam? Okay. Yes, 2011-12 was the first year that they switched from ITBS, ITEDS, to Iowa assessment. So this is the same exam over the course of that time. Um, and this shows our expected growth in the area of mathematics. Okay. You know, those are, those numbers, those aren't numbers where we want to be. No. And that, no, I would agree with you. They're not as high as our reading. We've um, put a lot of time and effort into that reading um, piece, but we also don't want to let the math piece go. So what are you I doing differently for? Well. Okay, what are we doing? <laughs> My next slide. So um, some of the things, as I had mentioned, so I'm glad I read that one well. <laughs> so um, it's good for us to have this information. And again, we tend to look for those trends over time. Um, and we're digging that data down to a pretty fine level. Um, we break this data down seven ways for Sunday. I mean, we are looking at lots of different pieces of that um, to help us make decisions. But some of the pieces that we already have in process based on this year's data as well as last year's and, and previous years, um, a couple of things at the elementary, so the first two bullets there. We have implemented uh, new math materials this year. Um, so that was a full-scale adoption, K-5, which we think will have an, uh, make a difference for students because they're a little bit tighter aligned to the core, as well as providing a lot of PD for our teachers on the core standards. Um, we've also implemented a performance-based reading assessment, which um, is important and we think kind of drives how we instruct um, our students, and we think that is going to be a pivotal piece as we move forward into the future um, as well. We currently offer our extended day program, which is kind of like the after-school tutoring program at every one of our elementary schools. Um, at the middle school level, we are working to restructure uh, the advanced math class to guarantee that none of those Iowa core standards are missed. If a student is participating in a curriculum that's a little bit faster paced, that's fine, but we want to make sure they're not missing any of the core standards that they need to have. So we're taking a look at that, as well as we are in the process, as we speak, we had teachers in today even, to work on the development of a second literacy class or, um, at, that all students sixth grade through eighth grade will take. Um, at the middle school level. So that's been kind of a uh, pretty fast pace, but that'll give our students two classes of literacy, so, which we think are important. Um, at the secondary level and across, but it, more at the secondary level, we're in the beginning stages of developing those common benchmark assessments at the high school. And then um, we are in the process of restructuring our science courses and taking a look at um, the sequence of those courses so that we better align to what the core is stating so that we can influence that science um, achievement as well. And then across all of those levels, we're in the process of identifying those priority standards in math and ELA and then as we move forward into the future, social studies and science and all of those areas. And then um, from priority standards to the kind of benchmark assessments to focusing into more instructional design. 
Yeah, so we have lots of questions. Yeah, okay. Nancy? The, it, the extended day program, you mm -hmm. said it's offered at, ele at the elementary school. How many yes. students participate in that? Is there a tracking? Um, um, yeah, that data is tracked. I don't, do you know the numbers? <coughs> We average about 30, and we've done two different sessions this year. We did a fall or a winter session, and then we started again in January, February, and it went until about May. And it's about 30 in each session. Each building kind of focuses on what they feel is a target. Either it's reading and math together, just reading, just math, or maybe even a specific grade level, looking at their data. Are students tap then to participate in those programs? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. We identify them and we invite them and we do everything we can to get them there. To you know, work with parents to get them there every day. John? So the parents oh, are informed too of this. Yes. Extended. Yes. Absolutely. John. I was just going to say, you know, um, I I applaud. I think in the reading area, we're making mm -hmm. some big gains, and I see yep. that, and that's critical. That's one of those core areas, but uh, the math area has me very concerned as. Um, we look at STEM and uh, some of these other initiatives. When I listen to our uh, colleagues at Kirkwood Community College and they're telling us that um, math is one of those f fundamental things that even if you're in a, a career tech program, Absolutely. it's not just going on to four-year college, but that's just one of those fundamental things in, in thinking that uh, the kids have to have. So, you know, at the college and university level, they've implemented supplemental instruction time. They're doing online, above and beyond. I know my own daughter's taking college or college preparatory math classes. Some instructors they clicked with and understood, and other, others they didn't. Um, what kinds of things are we trying to do based on research that will help kids beyond? I mean, they have one teacher, and if they don't get it from that one teacher, they don't get it. So, um, Some of the things curriculum-wise in the area of math, again, is the identification of those priority standards for, we worked this year in Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2. Mm -hmm. Our conversations next year with that is going to be into those advanced courses so that they're a, more tightly aligned among the schools, so advanced is advanced. Um, we also, um, there are going to be intervention times offered at every one of the schools and maybe Mary Ellen can speak a little bit more about that at the high school level but that will provide those students the opportunities to get that instruction um, that they need well I, I would I would certainly encourage it just from the college and university level the supplemental instruction for students that are struggling in math especially in the science areas can raise up to a full yes. grade point uh, if they do it on a consistent basis in those really uh, critical thinking sort of classes. And that's part of the conversation with our science sequence as we think about that science sequence, making sure students have the appropriate math mm -hmm. as they move forward into that science sequence too. Okay, yeah, I, I would like to hear more about that as we yeah. go through this. I, I would just add that um, I can comfortably say that we will have intervention support at each of our buildings next year, and that will be um, structured and part of the schedule at our, all of our high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools. So I think that's an important part as well. John, you kind of started out talking about what are the extra mm -hmm. supports that students are getting. Mm -hmm. So um, the, it, it's going to look a little different at each school, but um, in the past, um, we, I couldn't say that we had that structured as well as we mm -hmm. currently will for the next school year. And is there an online component to that? Do you know, Mary Ellen? Is there a, I mean, Khan Academy does it. There's some other services that we've looked at and talked about. I know that, again, at the higher ed level, they're using now successfully. So it's certainly something to look into. Okay. We do offer, at, the, at least at the middle school level, elementary, well, it's district-wide. It could be used by anybody, but it's more geared towards that middle school level, uh, the, like a Moby Max, which is kind of an online kind of, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'd say tutorial exactly, but it's just online practice for students. Yeah. Okay. Gary? Um, when did the information go to, have the individual schools have seen this? Um, information barely yes <laughs> it um, we got it back oh, I don't remember the exact date I want to think around June 5th or 6th and we got it out to the school so that they could use it for their school improvement planning which was June 13th okay so, and that was that mm -hmm. was the other part of my we're looking at a 30,000 foot view of you it. are yes and uh, the, to really have an impact 
it has to be drilled down to the individual Absolutely. schools. Absolutely, and they we disaggregate. That's disaggregated for them by subgroup. They can drill down to individual student level. They have that data at a much finer level. Right. I, I think this is the first time. Um, this, this is easy to look at. It's it's good information. I think it's the first time we've seen it in this format. Uh, concerned about although we're you know yes we have 74 percent that are proficient 70. 7% that are, are, are meeting expectations and, and proficient, but that's still almost mm -hmm. a quarter of the school is not. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. The it's something we continue to Getting the building uh, mm -hmm. improvement um, committees to be able to look at it, and hopefully our, our additional leadership that will go in, um, this should yes. be valuable information for them to help build yes. um, responses to it. Good comments, Keith. Earlier you said that it's the same test. Uh, yes. Looking forward, though, with the Common Core, uh, will these tests change to match up with Common Core? And are we being sure that we're aligned with the tests as they change? Because that's, that's one of the things that I've heard that we could see substantial drops in scores if we don't do that. Um. Right now, uh, Iowa still is using Iowa assessment as their state test, um, and until that, so that will be, until that changes, we'll continue to do that, of course. Um, if Iowa assessment changes their test to become more of one of those next generation assessments, kind of more performance based, we feel we are in um, a good spot with that. At the elementary level, we've already implemented a performance-based assessment, so we've got some information. This was our first year, but we're getting some information on how our students are performing on that. Um, all of our work with the alignment of our priority standards and our scaffolds and, our, and as we work to instructional design, that is all very tightly aligned to the core, um, to the Iowa core, so that our teachers are understanding and working with and breaking down those standards um, pretty frequently we're looking forward to um, using our instructional design strategies to kind of continue to provide that next level of support and how do we use those standards in our instruction at the building level so I feel pretty comfortable that we are absolutely headed in the right direction with that and we are um, on a good path John so you said this this data can get broken down to individual students yep. sub subgroups is there specific feedback by teacher for how they're performing that that can help in their professional development and learning is does it get down to um, that level the bill individual buildings could do that we okay. provide the data based like on grade level so mm -hmm. and then as a building so let's use third grade for example if I have two sections of third grade I would just have to look at the names Mm -hmm. And I could break that down, and I do know that that's okay. they can look at that Great. data and do. So does that become part of a teacher evaluation or coaching opportunity, or um, how do you use that? It's not part of evaluation, okay. um, which is good. We don't yeah. want it to be punitive. Okay. Yeah, it can certainly be used, and I think it's just good information for the teachers to know themselves, yeah. so they can look at that and say, you know, you're doing, you're getting this result, I'm getting that result. Why are they different? What are you doing differently than what I'm doing? Um, are we, you know, we think we're doing the same thing, but it provides an opportunity for conversation to really dig into, are we doing the same thing? Other comments? <clears throat> Thank you, Carla. It is information we've seen in a different format, so it's really easy for us to read and digest. So we appreciate this difference in format. Um, next, we're gonna have turn this over to Dave Benson to talk about the 2014 and 15 school calendar. Thank you. With the decision of the board to move to an hours based system uh, and the discussion that the SIAC committee had uh, with uh, Dr. Pickering's uh, or under Dr. Pickering's leadership, uh, we uh, in the administration felt it was a good opportunity to bring the 1415 calendar that has been approved back for uh, a look-see. Uh, there are a couple of things that have, have uh, risen from the board uh, that we could uh, consider. Uh, should we uh, decide this evening to proceed 
with some changes to the 1415 calendar. We would schedule a hearing uh, for the July 14th board meeting, which would be a public opportunity uh, for comment and then uh, action on any changes. The uh, two things that I, I would like to call to your attention that have been called to my attention by board members as well as the work uh, that Dr. Pickering did was uh, the issue of the number of early releases for professional development. While we think professional development that is continuous and ongoing <clears throat> is appropriate, uh, we also recognize it creates some hardships in the community. Uh, so uh, for 14-15, uh, we presented you a calendar that had uh, in the fall and in the spring collapsed three days of early release, which are roughly two hours piece, uh, into one full day. Now we just picked uh, a day that was already a, a, a calendar day for a release, which happened to be a Wednesday, and it was pointed out to me that the SIAC committee uh, strongly urge the district to consider those to be either Mondays or Fridays. So with that consideration, we discussed uh, in uh, superintendent's cabinet this morning that we could move those days, uh, if the board felt that was appropriate, to the Friday of that week uh, and, and would have the same uh, uh, amount of time, only it's restructured. You haven't seen the proposed 15-16 calendar. We're working on that, and I can tell you that we are, are going to be proposing Friday in services uh, as full days. So moving and collapsing uh, one three-day block in the fall and one three-day block, uh, early release block in the spring, and moving it to a Friday would be a step in that direction. The other issue is the inconsistency of our spring break with the Regent Universities and uh, other uh, public schools in Lynn County. Uh, this seems to create uh, a lot of angst uh, in the community around issues that uh, I have this time but my child doesn't and the reverse week my child has it and I don't. So there's, uh, there's a lot of angst about that. Uh, changing spring break to align with other uh, K-12 publics in Lynn County and the regents under the 14-15 calendar would be possible uh, if that's the, the direction the board would like to uh, uh, go and, and we could make those changes and bring that back as a public hearing take public comment, and then take action. Uh, the only thing I would uh, call to the attention of the board is moving spring break always uh, has unintended consequences because there are, there are people who uh, may have been relying on uh, the published calendar uh, for their spring break in spring of, of uh, 15. Uh, but July to uh, March notice is is a large notice time uh, so uh, just be cognizant if if in your discussion ultimately you say yes let's let's try to move spring break there are unintended consequences that can uh, occur on family vacations or uh, other kinds of commitments but uh, we now have this opportunity I felt, we as administrators felt it was appropriate to give the Board of Education an opportunity to discuss it and provide direction. And with those uh, introductory comments, uh, uh, we'd be glad to answer uh, any questions uh, and take any direction the Board has on uh, going forward. Thank you. John? So I'm definitely in favor of, of what you've done to collapse these into a, a one day instead of all the half days on Wednesdays. And I would definitely support moving them to Fridays this coming calendar so um, families can count on that have a three-day weekend that's what I've been hearing in the public so I would appreciate that 
Um, in terms of the Regent Universities, they don't necessarily have spring break on the same weeks. So the three regents don't necessarily coordinate that. It's different every year. And we have so many private colleges as well and the community colleges, their spring breaks are on different times. So I'm not as married to the idea that our spring break has to be during a certain college's spring break because it's not always the same. So um, I guess I'd be open to more discussion on that if there's a real swell for, for changing it, but that's not critical to me. Other comments? Keith? I agree with John. The comments I've heard is it's difficult for parents when there's an early out or whatever for child care, et cetera. And I also know that uh, we're avoiding um, the in-service days in those first weeks of the year, which was an issue that was brought up last year. So I think that's also a, a good change in the calendar. Okay. Nancy? Well, I'm, I'm looking at when we talk about the spring break, and I agree with John, it's different at the the Regents Institution so okay. we're not on all on spring break at the same time so but I do like collapsing and just having the, the Friday okay. Gary well first on the uh, on the th going from the half or partial to full day um, you know we just heard a report on uh, some of our successes and not so successful in, in reading and math and I would concur that I also hear that it is a, a burden on parents, uh, but I also believe that parents want us to be successful as a, as a district. Um, we, um, the ongoing uh, uh, in service, I think, does provide staff uh, more readily an opportunity to address and look at the student needs. Uh, and make adjustments and corrections and have those professional conversations that I think uh, are help. Going to a full day, it's, uh, it spreads that out and then it concentrates the effort um, uh, to a shorter period of time. Uh, I think uh, we all know that learning is more advantageous when it's uh, done in, in shorter spurts and, and repetitive. Uh, a one-shot time does not uh, work as well. Uh, on the spring break, uh, not only the regions, but uh, I question even locally, does Marion uh, uh, College Community, Linmar, are they all in sync with the same uh, spring break time now too? So, uh, you know, is it, I've sat on the calendar committee in years past and it's, it is a, a real nightmare to try to coordinate. You know, it's a yeah, it's an unpleasant task. So I, I would question. I would like to see the other school districts too, because I think that has an impact. Well, that's that's interesting. Uh, let me find that out, and I'll share that with the board on Regent spring breaks in uh, spring of fifteen, as well as uh, how far out do you think we need to go with the with privates and or Kirkwood. I'm gonna do, uh, we have two uh, local uh, colleges or universities, Co and Mount Mercy, Kirkwood. The regions go five years out uh -huh. on their calendars. I was just thinking about answering the question of when spring break is for spring of 15 with the various institutions. I'll, I'll find out on uh, the Regent universities, Kirkwood, Mount Mercy, Co, you want to go out to Cornell or Grunell or uh, outside the city boundaries? No. Just okay. The the two post-secondary institutions that are private here in town, Kirkwood and the Regent Universities. We'll get you that information. If we're not aligned to the University of Iowa, which is and Kirkwood, which are two main players on the public side, would you entertain a calendar that would put us in alignment with those? Well, let me share my comments. Um, first of all, I do support collapsing the half days to full days. We've been doing half days for a dozen years now, or ten, at least 10 years now. I'd like to see something different and see if we can see an improvement in the scores opportunities we don't know we're surmising that these well we're not surmising it's based on data but other schools are successful with a full day 
Um, number two, I think the spring calendar conversation is really in alignment with Kirkwood because now that we're using the regional center, we would be a week off. And that creates a lot of hardship for the students that are currently enrolled mm -hmm. in our regional center. So I'm not as concerned about our region institutions as I am our partner institutions that our students are taking advantage of those programs. So from what I'm hearing in the conversation, I think it might be appropriate to go ahead and have a public hearing on the 14th and listen to the SIAC committee was overwhelmingly in favor of the full day and the spring break. And um, so I'd like to hear from others in the community. I know that we've had some conversation online about it as well. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage board members to take a look at those conversations and maybe Marcia can pull those up from the past because they were this year. I just don't remember what month they were held. And um, then you provide additional information regarding other calendars. All right, we'll schedule a public hearing for the 1415 calendar then for consideration on uh, July 14th. I assume on the 14th after the public hearing we'll make that decision? Yes. Okay, so be yeah. prepared to make that decision. Then. I would encourage you to do so because yep. we really need to get notice out and we'll bring you, a, on the 14th, we'll bring you a, a, a Taylor calendar also. Okay. And Taylor's school year actually starts a, a few week. days. The following week. The following week, so we'll need to get that uh, in order too. Okay, and then I had a question about any athletic competitions or performances or participation in co or extracurriculars, if those schedules have already been set for the 14-15 year, and if a change in the spring break week, how that might impact those activities and competitions. Mary Ellen will uh, survey our high school ADs. And okay. again, looking for those unintended consequences. And what else? And music, because I'm, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm pretty sure yeah. Wash has some music things I know going on yep. during spring break that's already scheduled. Yep, co and extracurricular. Mm -hmm. Other comments? Yes, Keith. I know when we had it on Fridays that um, it got scheduled in some cases for three day weeks or special events. And I think we need to make it clear that these are in service days and if we go to a full day schedule that's far from our intent for that for that to happen mm -hmm. the expectation is for our professional staff to participate correct another way of saying it we've had that discussion okay okay thank you okay um, moving on I'll turn this over to oh I'm sorry I was getting ahead of myself. Next, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve a resolution for a permanent underground utility line easement at McKinley Middle School. So, so is there a second, please? Second. Discussion? So, roll call action. Director Humbles? Aye. Director Anhalt? Aye. Director Laverty? Aye. Director Westerkamp? Aye. And President Meisterling? I abstain. Next, I'll turn this over to Dave and Laurel to talk about policy manual review and revision. Thank you. Tonight we are bringing you a series of regulations, procedures, and policies from our 500 and 600 series with uh, an additional one out of the 1,000s. Uh, if you have any questions about any of them that are presented this evening, we're happy to address them. Yes. So, and we just had this comment. So, uh, in policy 503, professional learning, I agree, all, all of it looks great. So in the last sentence it says, all members of the staff are encouraged to participate in appropriate professional learning opportunities. And I'm wondering why we don't say expected instead of encouraged. I mean, the intent is that as a board, we expect that our staff um, grow professionally and it has a different meaning to me anyway. I agree. Other comments? I had one on 506.6A, abuse of student by district employees. And if I look at the uh, paragraph following number Did two. Did you say 506, Mary? 506.6A, okay. yep. Abuse of students by district employees. Um, to constitute a violation has to have occurred on school grounds, school time, school sponsored activity, or in school related context. 
So if a student is out and about on a weekend and maybe at a movie or at the fair and they are confronted by a teacher and there's some abuse going on there, does that not count? Or is that a school-related context, just that they have a relationship? Correct. Okay. Correct. The, but uh, I want to make sure that's clear. It's 24-7 it's wherever that okay. may occur. For, for teachers, that's very clear. And it wasn't clear for coaches, okay. non-teaching coaches, due to Supreme Court action. And the legislature corrected that uh, oversight uh, this session in any okay. kind of an emergency basis. So we'll take a look at that language. Just want to make sure it's very clear. Okay, other comments or suggestions? Again, we appreciate the committee's work. I know that you spend an enormous amount of time wordsmithing and, and making sure that the intent is properly recognized in, that, um, in that, those items. So thank you very much. We really do appreciate it. Welcome. Okay, then moving on, um, I'd entertain a motion to approve the work agreement. 14 through 17 for the superintendent of schools. <coughs> so moved. Second. Please. Second. Discussion. Seeing none, this is a roll call action. Director Ann Halt. Aye. Director Laberty. Aye. Director Westerkamp. Aye. Director Humbles. Aye. President Meisterling. Aye. Thank you. Yep. Next is, um, I would entertain a motion for the 1415 Terms and Conditions of Employment for Local 308, United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners of America. So move. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none, this is a roll call action. Director Laverty. Aye. Director Westerkamp. Aye. Director Humbles. Aye. Director Ann Halt. Aye. President Meisterling. Aye. Seeing no further business before this board, we stand adjourned. Thank you. Mm -hmm.